So filmmaking is not only your ability to communicate words, but also it's your ability to limit the amount of words that are coming out of an actor's mouth and then share their expressions and the cinematic choices within the film to help share the story without even needing to compromise on those different elements. I feel like when we limit the amount of words that we use in a film, we give an opportunity for the audience to discover these ideas in the story themselves. When I watch a film and at the end of it, I'm able to communicate to myself what it was about, I feel a lot more accomplished and a lot more connected to the film as a whole. And I think director Felipe Milo really illustrates this well in his short drama, Sleepwalk. So I wanted to take a couple of minutes to break down the lighting and the cinematography within the story and kind of explain why I think that it was so valuable to the film as a whole. And then I wanna try and explore ways that we could recreate this short film on a lower budget, as well as look at what they might've used to create it for themselves. And the first scene we actually see our character in, it gives a bit of mystery to the character, but it's also in a car. And a lot of scenes in cars aren't that dynamic. And I love when I get to see somebody do a dynamic scene within a car. We have some contrast on the hand between the bright parts of his hand and the dark parts of his hand. And then it also happens on his face. And what's lovely about this is the light's not hitting from behind him, casting all of this light on the back of his head where we're shooting. It's casting in front of him, which if you were shooting from in front of him, you would get a very clean, bright look on his face. But because we're to the side of his face, we're getting a very contrasty and conflicting image. And this is our first complex lighting scene. There's a lot of different things going on, but I'll try and break down the most important parts simply. The first thing that I notice is that the light's coming from the left and it's shooting onto his face, which we can tell by the uh, contrast line that we have right here. And it's giving us a Rembrandt lighting on his face. This is a really fun way to key a character, uh, especially the, uh, the protagonist of the character, because it allows for there to be some conflict in the story because it's not just one side bright, one side dark to create hard contrast, but there's some mix to say that there's conflict in the story, but this character is important. And I think they did a really good job of illustrating that here. And we can also tell that it's a warmer source, which helps establish the time of night, but it also gives some different textures for the experience that he's going through. We're at about a 3200, and this could have been a light from the left that's either something along the lines of an actual tungsten light, like a 1K or a 2K, or it could have been a 300D with an orange gel over it, or a bicolor light. And looking at all the different textures and light that's in our scene is really helpful to get an idea of how we can create this kind of texture in our own scenes. So the, one of the things that you'll see near the metal over top of his head is the actual light casting from the outside source, or maybe another light that's giving you that different source there. But then you have these other two lamps that are casting lights on the walls. And what's really fun about this is it kind of gives some motivation for the light hitting his face that might not be from the outside light, but it's also not being the actual source for the key. There's not an even light across his face, which helps give you uh, more contrast, but it still lets you see those lights in the image. So they're casting light on the background, but it's not necessarily the main key source on his face. And dimmers are really helpful to help get the output that you want out of light bulbs or using something like the aperture RGB light bulbs that you can control from an app. But then you look at the different parts of the image and there's darkness. I think it's super easy to just want there to be a bright image in your scene, but the more lights that you use like grids and then Lico's and, and different focusable Fresnel's, it lets you spill the light in areas that you actually want and keep the light off of other areas that you don't. And then we look at our source, it looks like it's some kind of motivated street light. Um, it could be something outside or maybe it's a sign on the actual uh, motel or maybe it's a, a car light or, or just cars going by. You get a little bit of a flicker to give you an uncomfortable feel. But it's really, really easy to set up something like this that's either in the room itself, in the corner of the room, or it could be actually shining through uh, the glass on the window. Uh, we might try and break this scene down practically in Cinetracer to get an idea of what this could be. And when we move on to the next scene, I actually really love the entrance of this character into the diner that he's headed towards. One of the main reasons being it doesn't light everything up. I think too often in our films, we think that good lighting is making sure that the character is always keylit uh, and not allowing for there to be some shadow or even moments of shadow that the character is in some kind of silhouette. And the scene where he finally sits down is extremely important to establish the character's face. Uh, any kind of profile or close up is going to give us a lot of ideas as to who the character is, as well as the story behind the character's intention. So the first thing you might notice is that there's a key from the left of him, and then there's a lot of darkness on the right of him. So he's moving toward a conversation with somebody. 
You'll assume that the light is coming from one of the windows, but this is probably an HMI or some kind of source coming from the left side of them. This could be soft or hard, but because we're off to the side where the light isn't hitting, there's still some contrast, but it allows for there to be some nice textures on the skin. And when we actually look at the contrast ratio on his face, it's very split tones. We have a little bit of Rembrandt lighting, but even more than the last image, we're getting a conflict in the character and allowing there to be some tension as to who this mysterious man is. And to contrast that idea, when we're established to the first character he interacts with, there's a lot of soft light hitting his face. We have light coming from the same direction, so it feels natural, and this might be the same light source set up the right way. But also, we don't have as much contrast on the face, where the actual split off where it goes into dark is much further along his face. This helps this character feel a lot less conflicted than the main character. And it gives some interesting dialogue between the two because you feel this warm, comforting, caring old man actually having conversation with our protagonist. And so there's probably a large soft source hitting his face and that might be what's spilling onto the other side of his face, which we can take a look at in the wide shot between the two. It looks like very similar lighting. There might be something up in the corner of the room casting light into their faces or just as equally on the back side, because you see it spills over to the side of his face a little more than the last image, but it's also casting on to the main character's face. It's an easy way to be able to light both of them at the same time and then go in and shoot both of their close-ups based on that information. We're still getting a lot more light on the actual shop owner and that's allowing him to feel a lot less conflicted. And then again, we're getting our main character in a silhouette, which is giving him some drama and possible problems. Uh, it's interesting to take a look at possibly lighting this wide and then going in for our close-ups. And this to me is one of the most important scenes of this entire trick that they try to play on you. In this scene, more than anything else, the filmmakers are lying to you. And I think that's really cool to notice. Uh, there's a lot of questions as to what this man could possibly be doing in the town to raise the attention of somebody raising a hand at them and saying they're going to shoot them. And how they light and introduce the character really intensifies that point. You have a very directional side light, which is giving a very dark side on one side of his face and a bright side on the other. This is a little bit more intense than doing something along the lines of Rembrandt. And it allows for the character to feel villainous and problematic. And placement within the scene makes sense as well. So I think I think it goes to show that how you block your characters matters to the lighting and then the overall realism of the scene and it helps to tell the story. Now this is particularly worth taking note of uh, out of all of the different scenes because I would really call this the hero shot of the film. This is where he's waiting for the pie uh, and I love it because the composition is really cool but also the conflict and the different things going on within the scene really add to the different elements. There's a bunch of different things to break down in this what seems like just bright image but I think it's just as complex and powerful as the nighttime scene in the bedroom. If we can look at what's actually going on as far as sources in the scene, you would think that this is coming from the window, but if you'll notice, there's only light coming from one side of his face, which you could chalk up to them being in a corner room. But if you look at the wide scene again, it looks like there should be still be light hitting his face from the entire room. Uh, so what they probably did to achieve this is bringing in a negative fill from the left side. A negative fill is basically the opposite of bringing more light into the scene. It's bringing a, a flag in to help with balance as well as any other sources that might be spilling into the scene to add that contrast ratio. And I think it's important to notice a couple of the different tones that are going on within the film. So if you look at his hair, you can see he's backlit by the light outside, which is making me think that that's not the light hitting his face. Partially because the light hitting the back of his head is kind of blue, almost a light blue compared to the light hitting his face, which is a little bit warmer. Uh, I can only come to assume that this is setting the white balance to somewhere around 4200 and keying him with a light that's a little bit warmer than 4200, maybe 4200, 4400, uh, and that's giving you a warm look on his face but still natural, while the outside ends up being another source that's hitting the back of his head and allows there to be some separation. Again, the negative fill adds the contrast, and this moment's really important. It's showing his willingness to wait for what he was looking for, and it adds a lot of contrast and conflict into the the moment in the story. Is he waiting for something that he's not willing to talk about? Uh, the story doesn't necessarily tell you.
And then when we move forward into the film, it very simply breaks down the passage of time by allowing there to be a couple of different color tone shifts to show the next part of the story. Uh, we're moving to a 3200 key, which is allowing it to feel a little bit darker at nighttime, as well as there's some different colors. There were blues and browns and all of these different colors in the previous shots. Now we're mainly around some tungsten and orange and red tones, which is going to be important for the next frame. And when we go into the next dialogue, we actually have a much more conflicting and scary looking scene. And I think it's important to notice all the different pieces of lighting that's actually going on within this. Uh, we have a much stronger contrast ratio, which is very fitting to almost make this character seem like a villain at this point, or maybe he's confronting something that's very dangerous. Uh, and then you have a key from the right side of his face, and then also uh, a lot of negative fill on the left side of his face, so it's very intentionally placed for the lighting, as well as we have this red accent light that's kicking on the back of his head, uh, for one, again, to separate him from the scene, but it also gives this sense of danger danger and mystery to the moment. And then when we turn around to actually reveal the other character, what I like here is you have a similar level of danger and not as much contrast and a little bit more fill, uh, but also you have this background behind them, but you still have the same amount of uh, conflict. You can add some interesting elements dependent on the story, not just the desire for it to be pretty. And because the focus was on the story, I think the images are still very beautiful. But what was really fun to find out as we pull out of the frame is he reveals he's trying to keep a promise. And we get this wide scene where she embraces him and starts to recognize that there's something good in the moment, but still mysterious. And so you actually don't see any of the key lights hitting them. And I love this because you can create a really dynamic scene without there being this key hitting them and allowing for a lot of the beauty from the scene to come from the shape and the edge light all around him. Later on in the film, we actually have the first scene where our main character doesn't have as strong of a contrast ratio on his face. And this gives us this sense of resolve that he's started to do what he said he would do. And we start to hear a little bit more about that as he progresses. What's also interesting to kind of note about the color tones within the film, it looks like there's a very natural key within the scene, but then they color graded or even just allowed for the rest of the color tones to be something opposite. In the film, if you watched it, you find that the character ends up eating his mother's pie as his last meal. And all of the resolve leads to this moment where he's going to be killed. And what's so unique about the experience of his journey is he's going into something terrifying and not normal. But he's moving forward into it. We have the light coming from that journey, but he's moving toward it to the right. I think that if it was the wrong thing, they could have had him go toward the left so it felt like he was doing something wrong. The cinematography tells you that the character is moving forward into where he's supposed to be going. And it allows for this terrible and dark and confusing choice to be something really, really valuable. <clears throat> it allows for this terrible and terrifying action to be some kind of resolve. And I think that's really unique. And when we look at the final scene of the film, you see the conflict has come back onto his face with the contrast ratio because he notices the journey that he's gone on is affecting him. And it mimics the scene of him waiting to have the pie to him sitting in front of it. If we jump into this first scene in Sin Tracer, I really like the scene that we ended up getting. And what's funny about it is it's not as complex as you might think. As we talked about in the lighting breakdown, uh, some of the lights in this were practical, they were simply dimmed down compared to the main key to be able to fill the room with light as well as create some shape on the sides of the walls, but it's not what's actually keying him. If we look at the light outside, we have a large source shining through the door or a window casting a beautiful warm tungsten light on his face. Now this could easily be replaced with any kind of light that you need. Depending on your purposes, you can bring up the ISO and use a Godox SL60, a 2K, or an Aperture 120D. There's not really a specific light that's perfect for this, but the best thing to use is something along the lines of a one source or a mono light. The reason being it'll help to control the shadows and the multi lines on the shadows compared to panel lights. And to flag off some of that light, I used a C stand with a flag on it. You can use anything like black wrap or barn doors to be able to flag in that light. And when we actually go into the scene, we have a very low ISO and a low aperture to really give this some texture and depth, as well as removing the amount of sharpness and our attention and focus is on specifically what he's going through. In the actual scene, it looked like they had a tilt shift lens, but it's difficult to emulate that for foreground depth, but you could easily add something in to help with that. 
Replicating the scene was a little bit more difficult than the previous, and there's a lot of different things going on. Uh, but one thing I noticed when shooting this scene was how difficult it was to get this lighting set up and then replicate it for the close-ups. We're gonna get pretty close, but I don't think we'll be quite exact. Again, we're able to see that it's not a ridiculously complex setup, but in fact, it's two lights that are creating this scene. Of course, whenever you're on set, you can add different lights to add fill and bring up different areas of contrast. But the main two things that I did for the scene was add in a book light and a flag. And all a book light is, is a bright source bouncing off of one thing and then going through the diffusion. So it's diffused bounce going through diffusion material. And that creates a really soft, large key. And I wanted that for the main person because it creates a nice soft source but I didn't want all that light to spill onto the background, so I brought in a flag to be able to keep a lot of that light off of the background. You can easily do this with something like a Godox SL60 uh, and using ND on the windows and then bringing up your ISO on something like a Pocket 4K or an A7 III. And then for our rim light that gave a little extra kiss of texture on the back of their heads, I used a C-stand and a boom arm and then an RGBW light to be able to add in a little bit of an orange texture, which helps tie in some of the practicals into the scene and then give some color contrast as well. When we compare the two final scenes, it's pretty simple to be able to replicate this kind of look. So I'm having a lot of fun doing these cinematography breakdowns. And I think that there's so many different opportunities for films like this to challenge and inspire us on our own projects. And I'm excited to start trying some of these ideas out on uh, some of my own projects, as well as some of the scripts I'm starting to write. And I feel like there's a lot of different times that we don't look at the smaller projects that are more possible to inspire us. And that's one of the big reasons why Indy inspires me.